you about Wyoming honeybees um, and some of the current issues going on and how it affects Wyoming. And I'm also going to specifically talk about some research that me and a couple of colleagues are involved in. Um, Mariah Emke and Linda Thromstrom, um, also economists, so you're going to hear a lot of economic costs, benefits, profitability aspects of what I'm talking up here. So, first thing I want to talk about are some of the issues. So, um, maybe some of you heard that honeybees are disappearing at drastic rates. And so, where are the bees gone? And that's a question that we're trying to answer, not us in economics, but some of the sciences, but that has some economic implications. So, since around 2006, in the United States, um, honeybees have been decreasing about 30% per year. Not 30% overall, but 30% per year. Each year we see a 30% decrease in the honeybees. Most of them are due to honeybee loss, loss from death. Now aggregated um, over those years, we see that today we have about half the number of colonies of honeybees that we did about in the 1940s. Um, in the 1940s, we had about 5 million honeybee colonies, and now we have just over 2 million. So it's a drastic decrease. Um, so why are the bees dying? Well, um, they're dying from disease, pest mites, the varro varroa mite um, is one of the main causes. Uh, Valbrew, both European and American, um, are leading to some of the deaths um, that have been reported. Poor nutrition, especially in Wyoming, lots of the honeybees are dying over winter from essentially malnutrition, pretty much dying off because they are starving. And also there's unknown factors. Um, some of you probably heard of colony collapse disorder. And that's what we're talking about unknown. We don't really know what the cause of colony collapse disorder. All we know is that the bees are disappearing. They essentially abandon the colony, never come back again. So why do we care? Why are we interested in bees? Well, first of all, they're producers of honey. And this is probably what they're most commonly known for. Um, and global demand for honey is drastically increasing. And there's many reasons for this. Um, well, most of us use it as a form of sweetener. And people are becoming aware of some of the other health benefits of it as well. And replacing um, honey, um, sugars for essentially honey. Um, there's medicinal uses as well. Um, people are using it for the antibiotic, anti-antiseptic um, properties, anti-inflammatory properties, um, putting it together with, let's say, lemon juice um, for a throat collagen type issue. Um, stomach issues can be also helped. Some people are now suggesting that weight loss um, can be encouraged through uh, consumption of honey, daily consumption of honey. So there's another reason to consume honey. Skincare. Um, lots of honey products are now used in skincare, lotions and moisturizers, facial washes, and so forth. Also, people are really looking at the nectar source of honey. Uh, there's been a lot of research that suggests that um, if you consume honey that has been um, sucking on pollen and nectar from local sources, that can help your allergies. And so for all of these reasons, we see a huge increase in demand uh, for honey. But that's not the only thing um, that honeybees are good at. Pollination is something that we don't hear about, but it's huge. Most um, of the revenue that beekeepers receive is from pollination. Um, and what we know is that 70% of crops produced worldwide and the United States uh, for human consumption re rely on animal pollination. And 85% of the animal pollination is attributed to the honeybee. Most of this is managed honeybees, meaning it's not uh, these native honeybees around. What we're seeing is beekeepers are maintaining these honeybees uh, and transporting them to pollinate these crops. Without the honeybee, uh, estimates are about 90% of these crops would have significant decreases in production. Some of them would have absolutely no production. Some of them are completely 100% reliant on these managed honeybees, such as almonds. And so without the honeybee, we would see a drastic decrease in uh, pollination of these crops, and we would have um, some food shortage issues. So how does this affect Wyoming? Well, there are many ways this affects Wyoming. Um, 
Wyoming growers that depend upon animal pollinators, specifically the honeybee, um, may find it difficult to find honeybee colonies to come help pollinate. Now, alfalfa is one of the main um, growth um, crops that demand honeybee production. Uh, so, some of the big, but that um, pepper bee as well. Um, but why would we see that there would be a, a, not enough honeybees to pollinate? Well, we see not enough honeybees to pollinate, but there's also an issue of the increased price of pollination services. Because of the decreased number of bees available um, and the increase in this production of high value animal pollinated crops, such as cherries, almonds, and um, apples, we see that we have a sharp increase in the price that people are paying for pollination services. And so for those of you in Wyoming that um, are trying to pollinate, let's say alfalfa, you might not, number one, be able to find any bees to help pollinate, and if so, you might not be able to afford the high prices that other people are offering those bees to pollinate. Um, what else? Well, um, why are beekeepers may be experiencing high mortality? So this 30% mortality rate yearly um, is still happening everywhere, even in Wyoming. And so if we see beekeepers either accepting losses and maybe moving out of the beekeeping business, or they're spending a lot of money on um, replacement costs. So essentially, they might be replacing colonies every single year, and that comes at a significant cost. And also, because of the um, pests, mites, and diseases, there's a lot of treatment costs involved that trying to maintain the colonies they have. And so, those are some costs the beekeepers. Well, for the consumers, there's also costs. Uh, you and I buying honey, we see a huge increase in the price of honey. So going to the grocery store, you're probably gonna see increases now over what you've seen before the price of honey, and we're probably gonna see continual increases in the price of honey as well. But it's not all, always a bad thing. There are some benefits specifically to Wyoming beekeepers. Well, the high um, honey prices means more revenue for Wyoming beekeepers, right? Um, we have seen record high for honey. Um, it is around $2.15 per pound at the retail outlet, wholesale outlet. But if you've ever gone to, let's say, a farmer's market recently and bought honey, it is astronomically high right now. Um, you can sell an eight ounce jar for about $10. Um, pound of honey is going to be about $20 and you can sell at retail. So that's a huge source of revenue for beekeepers um, is that honey production. And Wyoming's known for excellent honey. Now, that might not be commonly known, but we have some of the best honey in all of the United States. Um, and so we might be able to capture some of that revenue and increase prices by really looking at and pushing forward that idea that we have good honey here. Um, and the high demand for pollination with the low supply of bees means that we are also seeing record high fees paid to beekeepers for pollination services. Specifically almonds. Almonds are the push for these high um, pollination services. Right now in California, um, almond producers are paying about $200 per colony to come and pollinate their almonds for about six or seven days. Now that's a, quite a bit of money um, for six or seven days of service. And what can happen is, because it's only six or seven days, if um, a beekeeper decides to travel with their bees, they can pollinate different crops at different times, depending upon their bloom season. So you could pollinate almonds, and then move on to cherries, and then maybe move on to apples, and receive high rates for each one of those pollinations. In total, about uh, $300 per colony can be received for pollination services each year. So we're talking about significant amounts. Now, the issue I keep on talking about California, almond, cherries, and apples. Well, most of those aren't produced in Wyoming. They have to be transported. Now, this can seem like a significant cost of trucking your bees throughout the country. Um, 
most of the big trucks can hold about 500 colonies to 2,000. So for small um, individual um, beekeepers, that might seem overwhelming. But what we're trying to do is see if we can figure out you know, a coordination system. So numerous people can get together, coordinate to truck their bees together, to reduce the cost of that, and then get all the revenue associated with um, traveling to pollinate. So um, what this essentially means is that there's an entrepreneurial option for beekeepers in Wyoming to capture these revenues. And that's what we're, our research is really focusing on, is trying to encourage this entrepreneurship. It can be um, small backyard beekeepers um, thinking about, well, there's a lot of um, room for honey. I might be able to capture a lot of money, and so you might have a hive or two in your backyard and think about selling it at a farmer's market. But also, up to middle size, up to large uh, operations that have thousands, 6,000 I think is one of the highest number of colonies that an individual beekeeper has in Wyoming. So we're looking at the entrepreneurial positions um, for small to very large beekeeping operations. So let me talk about the current research being done. Um, there's really two projects that are happening right now. The first one is really looking at determining the costs associated um, with the beekeeping industry. So there is a large startup cost. Uh, managing bees, getting all the equipment needed for beekeeping, and trying to determine the cost with that and the ongoing cost of maintaining it. How much are we paying for replacement of those uh, colonies lost? How much are we paying to treat? Um, and we're looking at this not only for large beekeepers, but just the hobbies, the one that has it in their backyard um, to maybe sell honey at the local co-op or just to maintain for their own garden. This research also is looking at um, the revenues received um, from um, honey production and from pollination servicing. So we want to know how much honey is Wyoming beekeepers producing? Where are they selling it? How much are they receiving for each type of, of outlet they're selling their honey? We also want to know how many Wyoming beekeepers are pollinating, how many of them are traveling to pollinate, and how much, what types of crops are they pollinating, and how much are they receiving, to really get an idea of what the revenue associated with beekeeping is and the cost to determine how profitable it is, beekeeping is, at all different types of levels, size levels for uh, a beekeeping business. And this is, um, we just sent out a survey uh, a couple months ago to all Wyoming beekeepers, and we're just getting um, back the surveys and we're ending the data. So we should have some preliminary results of this um, within the next month, and hopefully by next year we'll have a lot more and be able to do full reports on this. But the second one I want to talk about is um, a really current one that we're just in preliminary stages of. And this one is looking at um, Wyoming consumers' willingness to pay for Wyoming produced honey. Is there a premium? Are people willing to pay um, for the local aspect of it? Um, and some of the issues with honey are when we know where it's made, we know that it's made under U.S. standards. But a lot of the honey that we're seeing, about 70% of the honey that's available at the grocery store is imported. And some of the issues with imported honey is that it might exceed antibiotic standards set by the U.S. government and pesticide, herbicide standards um, placed by the U.S. government as well. Also, it may be produced with unethical um, production. It might be produced with human labor, human labor, child labor, um, unsafe working conditions. This is specifically an issue in China, which is where we historically got a lot of our important honey. Now that's outlawed, but what's really interesting is that all of a sudden, the areas right around China, we see a huge increase in the uh, export of their honey, which is kind of suspect, and there's a lot of, I think, um, within the community is that China is illegally exporting their honey to surrounding regions, and then we're directly importing that. So there might be some issues with the honey that's associated with the grocery store. And so, why are people willing to pay to have ones they know is produced in Wyoming, know it meets Wyoming's 
and the U.S. standards on pesticide, herbicide, um, antibiotic use, um, and also some of the um, U.S. standards with labor. And so, if there are is, if we're willing to pay for this local aspect, that might give an incentive to Wyoming um, honey producers to label their honey, either made in Wyoming, maybe the county, maybe the city in which it's located, in order to capture that premium. So not only uh, they, will they see the increase in the honey prices I showed earlier, but they might be able to ca capture even more. So this might give an incentive for labeling. And yes, we're thinking about, or we are going to be uh, doing this about early next year, and we're actually going to be doing experiments with people from the community, and we're going to be doing it here in Sheridan. So we are interested in your input and help. I know we're not doing it now, but we are looking for people to come and do an experiment to figure out your um, demand, your willingness to pay for honey in Wyoming. Um, what can you expect if you come to this? Well, um, you'll learn a lot more about honey, um, some of the benefits of honey, um, and there's a little bit of extra incentive of we'll pay you to come. It's not the primary reason you come, but yes, there's some additional money involved that we pay you to um, be part of the experiment. Now, you might be thinking, why would I do this? I don't know anything about honey. Well, it doesn't matter. We want people with a whole wide range of um, understanding and experience with honey. So even if you don't buy honey, even if you only have it every once in a while, maybe as a sweetener on um, your pancakes, we still want to hear your input. So if anyone's interested, please let me know. I will write down your name, and I will be contacting you early next year. We're thinking um, January, February, March at this point in time. We're still in the preliminary stages of this. We're not 100% sure. Um, also, um, I have some cards, business cards, if anyone wants to take it, if they're thinking about it, and they can contact me. OK, so are there any questions? Yes. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, first, on the quality of honey, do you know per, per se what is it about Wyoming or our crops or whatever that makes it such a high quality honey, or is it maybe the honey producers that have a drive for high quality? So we went to um, the Wyoming Beekeepers Association last year and we talked to them about this. And it seems to be a combination of both, that um, Wyoming beekeepers are interested in having high quality honey. So they go to nectar sources that produce high quality honey. And um, we have pristine environments here. Um, and I think those two together combine to, the source is great and there's a drive to keep it great. So those two combine to give us really good quality honey. Okay, so then on top of that, if you are increasing um, the producers of honey mm -hmm. in the state, yeah. then are you expecting the quality to decrease with that because you're not keeping those premium producers out there seeking the higher quality honey? That is an interesting question. Now, it could. It could be that um, we would see a decrease in the overall quality because we have a competition for the best nectar sources. Um, that could be an issue. Um, and that would be something that would have to be a long-term study to determine if that would be an issue or not. But that is an interesting question, a research question that we could probably look into. Great. My last question oh, for great. you is uh, you talked about getting multiple producers to combine their yes. hives in transportation. And I don't know a whole lot about the honey business or bees or whatever, but I know that when you bring multiple sources of animals together in transportation or yes. in hive, volume of captivity, your risk of disease and issues of that increase your mortality rate goes oh. up. So how would mm -hmm. that transcribe, especially when you're talking about 10,000 uh, colonies being transported at yes. one time? So that is one thing I did not mention, but that is a risk um, that has to be taken for this. Yes, combining all different um, bees from different areas. As what I said, there's a lot of pests and mites um, and diseases that are very communicable. And so this might increase um, the mortality rate for those that are willing to do that, that risk um, and get on those. So yeah, that could be an issue which might increase the mortality rates. Um, currently, 
Um, most of those that are shipping their colonies around, I, we haven't picked up an increase in their mortality rates compared to those that don't at this point in time. But again, um, that would be a long-term study. That would that'd be a very, um, very interest, very high interest to, I'm assuming, a lot of people. You made some very good points. There is a lot of commingling, though, on those when we move them because the hives are pretty much self-contained. Yes, yes they are. This is not where I belong. Mm -hmm. So there is very few commingled bodies to even and transmit that, that disease. That, and that's true. That That is true. What Where the commingling usually happens is in these staging yards. So what will happen is um, if you're going to take your Wyoming bees to California, you don't just drive them to California specifically only for those few days you're going to be doing, let's say, almonds. You take them usually to a holding yard and they're more likely to move around there and that's where um, the disease spread usually happens. But there could be a case where you could um, transport together but then take your bees to different holding yards and that could reduce the risks of the spread of the disease. Yes? Just a couple of questions. What happens in the winter? In the winter? What happens in the winter? What do you do with your hives in the winter? It, okay, so it depends. So when we're talking about um, pollination services um, in California and um, up into the Northwest. Most of that happens during um, the winter months, the preliminary winter months, oh. April, May. So um, instead of them like essentially hibernating in Wyoming, you take them to California and keep them active year round. So it depends upon where you're pollinating and when their seasons of bloom actually is. So you wouldn't have, you wouldn't be busy as heck in the summer and then do nothing in the winter. You'd be pretty much active year yes. round. Yes, active, active year round. Um, those that have, do a lot of uh, this, this transporting of honeybees, they got back from California, I'm about a month and a half ago, from being there all winter long. Yeah. The other question I had was, is there one species that we use here, the Europeans, or do we, are, are there hybrid different species? Or there stuff? are different species, but there is one main species, I don't have the name of it right here, but there is one main species that's about, um, I think it's about 75% of the beekeepers in the U.S. use this one species of um, honeybees. Okay. But there's African honeybees, there's ones from Canada, um, but I think most of them are the African Honeybee. So is the mortality different among the different species? Uh, it matters who you ask about that. Um, I think each, a per, each producer of the honeybees essentially says that theirs is the most um, robust. But it depends. Some of them are more robust against, let's say, rural mites. But then they're more susceptible to the fowl group. So it depends. Each one has their pros and cons. So the 30% decrease each year is overall? It's pretty much overall, yeah. And of course, um, depending upon the species I have in the region, some might do better in some areas and do worse in other areas. So that's a gross um, estimate of all of them averaged together. Did you have a question? No, I just going to make a comment. When they're not, the bees aren't out pollinating, they have to be fit. Yes. And that, that's, so that's where... A, that's a big job too. Yes. So that's where, uh, where was that? I had that as one of the costs. Somewhere. Oh, uh, I don't know where I have it. But yeah, one of the main costs of, and one of the main issues, reasons why we see high mortality rate is essentially they're starving. And so to keep them from starving, a lot of people have to pay a lot of money um, to produce, essentially give them something to eat during the winter, especially here in Wyoming. Well, if you leave enough honey in the hive, they'll just eat their honey. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because we have a top bar hive. It's only our third year of keeping bees and kept it through the winter, but I, I got nervous that I brought too much honey because I'm getting serious. And so I, yeah. I ended up being, you know, uh, going into the dead of winter and then I, I was happy to see a bee fly out come exactly. springtime. But, and then as soon as they got active in the floor flowering, I was probably better than a total of a half gallon. Okay, and some, and some, yes, exactly, so most of them they feed in the honey, but if you want to sell honey, how much honey do you extract, 
um, and would they feed them a replacement? Some of them um, feed other types of sugar in order to hopefully keep them, uh, at least get the nutrition they need to make it through the winter. But that's the scary balance, and beekeepers are having trouble um, because we don't always know how long the winter's going to be here in Wyoming. That can be a, a scary issue. And, um, and that is some of the benefit of taking them to California to pollinate is you reduce that risk right there because they're constantly pollinating and getting to that nectar to the bee. So, so is your product affected by what you feed them? Yes. So um, what is interesting is that um, almonds are the number one demander of pollination services, but almonds do not give honey. So you can't get honey from um, uh, pollinating almonds. And so there are other, so that's a balance you have to make, is what types of crops give you good nectar sources? Those usually have a much lower um, fee associated with pollination services. And sometimes beekeepers will actually pay for the right to pollinate your crops. Clover, alfalfa, some of those uh, people are actually willing to pay, beekeepers are willing to pay to pollinate those to get good quality honey. And so we see those two aspects going on. We see um, growers willing to pay for um, beekeepers to bring their um, bees there and pollinate. We also see beekeepers paying growers in order to capture their nectar. So that's associated with one of those costs of um, a beekeeping industry, especially if you're interested in, in selling good quality honey. Any questions? Okay. Let me know, please. I'm almost begging you. <laughs> Please think about a being coming next year and being part of this uh, this experiment uh, for Wyoming um, honey. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to come back in the next a year or two and um, give you an update about um, this research. And um, we'll have bulletins and those types of things available. And I'll have my cards if anyone's interested in an ongoing update. Thank you.